All right, great. I think people will be trickling in a little bit. Um, what we're doing here is we've got a panel that's going to share briefly some about their research that we're going to tie back into cyber learning to look at future research for uh, next generation high schools. So let me tell you a little bit about each person that's going to be participating. We've got, whoops, Jody Aswell Clark from Turk, and she's going to talk about using games as a way to assess implicit learning. And then Brenda Bannon has some, uh, some work with uh, sensor-based internet of things with team-based learning and an experiential kind of approach, which is really interesting. And then David Webb also has gaming, but from the perspective of children, uh, high school students, middle school students creating games. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Um, oh, first let me, sorry, first let me give you a little bit of over, overview. I mentioned that speakers will share their projects first, and then we'll move into the next session where this is a working session, and it's not just us speaking to you, but we want to get an interaction and dialogue going on, and that's really the purpose of the session. So the second half of the session, the last 30 minutes, is when we'll kind of go into, you know, how does this, how do these ideas really give us new directions for research and new ideas to think about research for next generation high schools. All right, first I'll introduce you to Jody. Hi, I'm Jody Asbel Clark. I'm the director of Edge at Turk. Turk's a nonprofit in Cambridge, Mass, that's been focusing on math and science innovations for 50 years. And in 2009, we founded Edge, the environmental, the educational gaming environment group. <laughs> and um, we're a team of science educators seven, just grew to nine uh, team, um, that are, most of us did a lot of curriculum development, teacher professional development and research through the 90s and watched um, as No Child Left Behind, we watched people get left behind. <laughs> and, um, and we realized that there's a lot of learning that takes place outside of school and in other environments that is not being counted and not being attributed. And that was really um, motivating us to, to look at digital games. Okay. And um, what I'm going to talk about, we've, we've gone through the last almost seven years of research, ten, eight years, um, and, and slowly what was evolving was a framework of implicit learning. And we realized that this has been talked about in philosophy, psychology, organizational and management, behavior psychology for decades, but educational researchers haven't tapped much into it. The misconception literature, DeSessa and Minstrel and McCloskey talked about it a bit with physics learning in the 90s. And, um, and Dan Schwartz and, and John Bransford talk about it in their preparation for learning model. And so there are some examples, but it, it's really not pervading this community. And what I mean is um, explicit knowledge is what we test, what people can say. They can articulate it on a test, in pen and paper, maybe even a clinical interview. Um, implicit knowledge is what they're not saying. They know it, we, they're behaving through it, but they're not saying it. And what we can do is look at those behaviors to be able to measure it. So our group does this through digital games. And we chose digital games. I mean, yes, they're widely popular. Yes, 90% of youth are, are spending their time in these games. Um, but they're sticky. And what I mean by that is they encourage people to persist and dwell long beyond what many of our curriculum would allow them to or encourage them to persist and dwell. And by doing that, they, they engage in rich and deeply, um, in co increasingly complex layers of um, phenomenon. And uh, Rich Halverson said a long time ago, it's as if the game designers read the learning science literature and got there first. The way learning is layered and scaffolded in some of these games is phenomenal. So they get the people to stay, and then they create digital footprints. Every behavior somebody does in a digital game can be tracked. And just the way Facebook and Amazon are analyzing our consumer behaviors and predicting what we want next, we can predict learning and infer learning through this. This is particularly um, important for learners who do not express themselves well in explicit um, assessments. 
So the way we do it is um, our group, we ground games in salient phenomenon. We create something um, around physics or, um, or computational thinking. And the, the act of playing the game puts per people into the situations of learning so that we can track their behavior and that becomes evidence of their learning. We've found in our studies that, um, well, I'll explain more about this, but we found that, that this isn't sufficient. What happens in the game stays in the game. You need to explicitly, you need to bridge that to explicit learning, and that's where teachers and educators come in. So we've used this model in several different games. Um, our our uh, NSF research for the last four years has looked mostly at physics games. We created one with, um, it's an n-body particle simulator. Each ball, this is called impulse, um, each ball has mass and is gravitationally attracted to each other, but there's no friction, and the different balls have different mass. This isn't taught. There's no teaching in this game. Kids go through, they have to get their ball to the goal, and they have to avoid co um, colliding into the other balls, or they die. And um, what we find, then we, we watch people. We use Silverback, where you can catch the screen capture and the audio video with the eyesight camera. And we send people through the game and we watch them play. And we listen to what they're doing and we watch their gestures and we look at their screen motions. And what we see is people will, will um, be clicking on the ball and then they'll go, whoa, let it float, let it float. They move their hands. I'm not going to exert force on this par particle. It is moving at a constant speed. It can, will remain moving at a constant speed if I don't exert force. They're not saying that. They say, let it float, let it float. <laughs> and, um, but a teacher, if a teacher knows the kid's doing that, they can walk up and say, hey, let me tell you what Newton said about that. And when that happens, we find significant gains on pre-post tests. So it's what the kid does in the game and the bridging. We were able to distinguish, um, use data mining detectors to distinguish that people are actually treating lighter balls consistently with less mass than, less force than the heavier balls. And again, you can go up and say, let me tell you what Newton said about that. That's Newton's second law. And um, for F equals MA. So we can distinguish that and the kids who do that consistently do better on the tests. And the kids who don't do it do worse on the tests. Similarly, the same model was used in optics. We looked at law of reflection, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, and also the math concept of slope. And we were able to, to look at different errors. We could distinguish through data mining, again, whether it was a puzzle error, is it an error because the game is kind of tricky, or is it a rotation error, which would mean that they weren't getting the angles right, or is it a placement error, which, which would deal with slope. And sure enough, if they were doing placement errors, they were not doing well on slope on the pre-post so, and by, accordingly. We're um, attributing this now to Zumbinis, a very widely popular game, award-winning, sold millions of copies. Um, and we've just brought it back and we have a grant to study computational thinking. This is very different. It's a process. It's a skill and uh, habits of mind that happen over long periods of time. And so we're trying to break this model down to that. And the last thing I wanted to say is we don't, the behaviors that come from games are not the only way that we should be looking at learning. There's all kinds of ways we can look at this implicit learning. And we're starting to do research with neurophysical sensors, EEGs and um, physiological sensors and, um, and eye tracking to be able to look at all types of learners. Are they attending? What's happening with their executive function? Um, we're looking at error response rates. I can talk more about that. But the point is to look below the surface of what's happening. And in high schools and in all, <laughs> any school that's depending on testing, we are missing a huge amount of learning if we don't keep, uh, look deeper. <laughs> so, hey, all right. thank you. Thanks, Jody. Next up, we have Dr. Brenda Bannon. Good morning. I'm Brenda Bannon. I'm a, an associate professor in the Division of Learning Technologies at George Mason University. 
And a lot of my work centers around a human-centered design process or a user experience design process in designing learning technology systems. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about a, an actual volunteer project um, that, uh, where I led a team of over 40 people in a NIST challenge. It was the Global Cities Teams Challenge sponsored uh, by NIST in order to uh, bring together deployment of interactive uh, Internet of Things devices in real world smart city contexts. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about the insights uh, related to that experience and, and the system itself. Um, the system is interesting, but I'm really interested in uh, both the system and the process and the participants that, uh, that, that engaged with us in, in reflecting on it. So uh, here you see uh, what we did was we actually took a smart city problem of multiple team systems in emergency response and uh, medical healthcare professional context. Uh, you see here Fairfax Fire and Rescue in a uh, engaged with Inova Fairfax hospital trauma team engaged in a real world simulation. We were tracking real time team based behavior. The reason we're doing this is because many medical mistakes are made in the handoff of the patient in between teams. So that socio behavioral construct of a multi team system is a very uh, complex construct to unpack. And we don't know much about how learning happens cross teams. Uh, so this was an experiment. We instrumented these teams, uh, all of the fire and rescue, the ambulance crew, as well as the Inova Fairfax uh, trauma team had sensors. Uh, and we were able to track their location, basically their proximity to the mannequin patient at all times from a, an accident scene into the ambulance, as well as uh, an 11 mile journey back to Inova Fairfax Hospital and within the trauma bay. So this uh, experiment actually taught us a lot about looking and visualizing complex multi-team behavior. Uh, certainly, the learnings from this could be applied, in, I believe, you know, to team-based learning context, potentially in the classroom. But I want to talk a little bit more about the process itself. So to do this, uh, we had uh, volunteer uh, 40 people from all walks of life, including high schoolers on our team. Here you see uh, high schoolers involved with a, a, a CEO of an analytics company. You see a computer science professor. You see eight government agency people. We had uh, healthcare. Uh, they all were interacting also with the, the fire chief of Fairfax City, as well as uh, the chief of surgery at Inova Fairfax Hospital. Hospital. The actual uh, human-centered design process of really designing this socio-technical system was of, of interest. And I believe it's a whole different type of process to think about designing an Internet of Things smart city application. The complexity goes way beyond uh, uh, any design context I have ever been involved in. Uh, but here you see it really forces you in, in really designing for real world, meaningful, community-based uh, environments. It forces you out of the box of designing for, for the computer and really into a physical, cyber physical sensor type of environment and it forces the kids who were involved out of the classroom and into the real world. They helped us define the problem. They helped us build some of the hardware uh, along with some uh, software engineers and computer hardware engineers that, that were involved. So it naturally, magically made an amazing community connection as well as um, covered a lot of ground in, in generating ideas ideas. And it struck me that as we were thinking about it, to have teachers and students involved in this process to help us use this human-centered design process to unpack complexity, it really involves, uh, you know, 
looking at systems, in this case, human-based systems, and being able to unpack that human system in order to instrument it, to look at the learning goal which we were after, which was to try to unpack this complicated human dance amongst this, these teams in order to ensure the safety of the patient, but also for the teams to look at their own behavior visualized in order to learn from that behavior in an experiential learning cycle in the debriefing session, which immediately follows. So here you see the trauma-based team, as well as some of the high schoolers who helped build the hardware, and the community-based design teams that just came on their own. It was a hackathon we threw for three, three days in Gaithersburg at the Think Institute. Um, all walks of life, all levels of knowledge, and the human-centered process of that, a lot of the design of this system evolved out of community experiences, like uh, a gentleman had a son, and at one point, you know, he, they got lost in the hospital system. Um, the trauma surgeon said, if you can just tell me who's in the trauma bay at what point automatically, that would help my process to know if I have the right people at the right point in time chronologically. How are we doing? So it, it, that human-centered design process was crucial. I cannot, um, I cannot emphasize that enough. And it really helped us think about translating that complexity. And high schoolers were involved in that. So we believe that this, this is one vehicle, it may be one context, to do all of those things we heard that were priorities this morning in, in looking at how NSF is defining uh, STEM-based content and STEM experiences. Here you see the actual proximity sensors that were placed on all of the, the professionals. And they emitted a signal, uh, a relative strength signal, every three seconds. Uh, and there were listening devices embedded in the SIM man mannequin, as well as at a couple of points along the journey. And we basically unpacked later that, um, uh, that those signal strengths and proximity in order to get a sense of where people were at what point in time across the context. This was the initial raw data visualization of the number of pings or number of, of hits of the sensors based on um, the listeners as well as the participants. We've had other visualizations and, and we're now working on our next run will be September, uh, hopefully spring of 2017, and we are going to add other layers of data and heterogeneous data streams such as biometrics and heart rate uh, and hope to define some core key uh, activities across that multi-team system that we can automatically uh, record. And this is important because the health professionals themselves, they don't want any extras in their workload. It's already demanding enough. So to design in a human-centered way, to understand what their problems are, to really hit the nuances of, of what needs to happen, how do they define teamwork across teams? This was the first time these teams had ever conducted a, a simulation cross-team in a high-fidelity real-world context. So we're hoping at our next run, the, we're working with human factors people as well as uh, engineers, as well as computational folks, to help us think about that whole spectrum of clarifying and enhancing the system in an iterative design research manner. So, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Brenda. Next up, we have David Webb from the University of Colorado Boulder talking about scalable game design. Okay, so uh, uh, glad to be here. I'm, I'm uh, Associate Professor of Math and Science Education at University of Colorado Boulder. And uh, my, my entry into education, though, was as a high school teacher in Los Angeles Unified. I was also a middle school uh, math and computer applications teacher. So I find myself at the University of Colorado very interested in, in math education, but I also uh, partnered with Alex Repening in the Scalable Game Design Project, which has been going on for a number of years now. And uh, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about that project, but then also I kind of get back to the, the theme of, the, of this meeting and talk about uh, what are some recommendations for next generation STEM high schools that can be drawn from some of this research. So the, uh, the Scalable Game Design Project uh, involves 
middle school, actually it's now K-12, but involves uh, primarily middle school students programming games. So, um, so they, they, they build games, they build the agents, they program the agent behaviors. So the, the connection to uh, the previous slide really is the, uh, uh, to get the, the ghost to chase Pac-Man is the same fundamental programming principles of collaborative diffusion and hill climbing that you'll use to have uh, the predator-prey model working in a science simulation. So we, we actually look at not just finishing the game, but also what are the computational thinking patterns embedded within uh, games that could lead to, I mean, games essentially are modeling phenomena. They're modeling interaction between agents and behaviors. Um, uh, and so trying to, to build and, and model STEM simulations, uh, getting kids engaged in computer programming, and then seeing how those models carry into contagion models, predator-prey models, forest fire, and such. Um, the, the sequencing of these programs is, is important too because the, uh, you don't want to start off with, in this case, the, uh, the Sims game, which is a very complex game to program. Uh, Frogger would be a more suitable place to start. But without, you, without a teacher having background in the, the principles underlying the programming here, uh, a teacher wouldn't know that. So there, there's, there's a lot of design principles at play in terms of not just building the game, one game or one simulation, but how to sequence these to develop uh, some core goals. So we also draw from this notion of uh, Csikszentmihalyi versus, uh, or not versus, but meets Vygotsky, where this notion of flow, games, games are sticky. Um, even programming games are also sticky. Uh, uh, students really enjoy working in this type of context. And, and so what we do want to do, though, is rather than teach them all of the programming requirements before they actually get to build something meaningful and interesting, we push the threshold first as a project first approach where we push into this place where sca just in time scaffolding and support can be provided not only by teachers but by peers, by also the, the, the way the software is designed where you, there's actually some conversational programming tools where students can try to get a better sense of using the technology, what this actually means. Does this actually match what I'm trying to emulate here? The other thing we've been doing with respect to research in this project is uh, we, we have gathered a, a lot of data around uh, student motivation. We also have been observing classroom practices. We have a lot of classroom observations. And we, the intersection of these two results in some, uh, some findings that shows that when teachers invest in a guided discovery model, when they invest in a more of an inquiry-based active learning model in a computer science classroom, which might be hard to imagine if you've had a computer science, a computer programming class, what does active learning look like in a computer programming class? But if teachers can, can draw upon student interaction, and rather than guiding students through a, a program as a recipe to complete, but actually have them figure out along the way what this means, why am I programming this way, what are other options, is there only one, right, one way to do this? then if, if they break open that model of a recipe model and actually have more sense-making experiences for students, it actually closes this uh, discrepancy, this, this, um, this gap between motivation that, uh, that is gender, uh, that is gender related, uh, that we've often seen. We see it in undergraduate uh, STEM education as well. But active learning, inquiry-based learning closes that gap and actually uh, improves the outcomes for, for all involved. And uh, the, the way we've been at work is, uh, initially, this eight years ago, we, we had a three-year funding project, an eye test project from NSF. And we, were, um, we said we, we might actually work with about 40 teachers and 1,300 students over about three years. And, and in terms of the, the stickiness, but also the, the, in, the motivation to engage in these activities, we hit 1,300 students involved in the first semester. And uh, right now we have about over 500 teachers who have been involved in this project and about 20,000 students, which we'll hit this year. And we started in Colorado and South Dakota, Dakota but it's kind of morphed out. And actually, this, this map is a little old because I know we have projects in Jackson, Mississippi, in Florida. Um, so this could be even updated. But the, what does this contribute to next generation STEM high schools? What, what, do our, what does our, this, this research, this line of inquiry contribute? 
Well, I'd say with respect to STEM and, and game simulation programming, or game and STEM simulation programming, this project-first learning approach is a fundamental one. And this is nothing new, that if students actually have a chance to um, engage in something meaningful, the skills kind of take a, um, uh, they, they don't become the focus so much but they still need to be made explicit along the way. The focus is completing the game, is completing the project, is gaining ownership of something I'm designing and I, I know how this works. The skills are learned along the way, but that's not the primary focus. Um, it can still be made explicit, but it's just not driving the instruction. The, uh, the technology, technology in, a, in this context there's iterative, ongoing, individualized feedback along the way. Students know if the game is working the way they want it to, if the simulation is working they want it to. They don't need a teacher or even a peer to tell them it's not working. It's not working. It's just not, I push play. It's not working. Or the ghosts aren't chasing the Pac-Man. Or the, the fox is not chasing the rabbits. Or the rabbits are just moving around. They're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, OK, so how do I change the program? So that type of feedback, that feedback that's provided by technology that's individualized, it's a very powerful piece that is associated with this, the learning component of cyber learning that we can, uh, we can really uh, push further into. I think it's also important that, uh, it, to identify these computational thinking patterns that can transcend an individual project or an individual simulation or individual game. And so this, uh, the contribution we can make going forward is what are viable, workable, instructional sequences that teachers can use? And what are these computational thinking patterns that can help promote transfer from, you know, if I can design Pac-Man, can I design a STEM simulation? So there should be this push to making those connections. And because of those explicit connections that we do make, we draw in math and science teachers. We also draw in language arts and social studies teachers into this project, uh, in addition to the IT elective teachers that were the initial target, uh, target group to be involved with this project. The student design of own programs, the ownership piece to these next generation STEM high schools, I think is also something that is, that is compelling and, uh, and hopefully that doesn't fade in the process of, of proposing what could happen. But um, the professional development piece is key. Uh, a number of things that we're asking teachers to do with respect to these new technologies, with respect to cyber learning, with respect to these wonderful activities that, are, that, are, that have been presented, is if they haven't experienced these, these activities for themselves as learners, they're unlikely to see the value of, of certain design principles that are at play within these activities. So teachers need, and we need models, and it's not just online PD for scale, we also need the face-to-face -face models to figure out how to, how to tinker with the professional development and make it work. Just moving right away to online professional development is, um, there's, there's many examples of how that doesn't work so well. So I think there needs to be multiple options because with both models, then you can have blended models and they both have value. They both have pros and cons. Um, the yield rates from PD to implementation uh, are, are different in the online models. Look at the MOOCs and the attrition rates in MOOCs. So what are ways to make the, the online PD models more productive and with higher yield rates? Are we, the current project we're in examines differences between face-to-face -face and online professional development. And our online professional development has yield rates of closer to 70%, where if teachers start, they're going to finish um, by the end. But that's because it was based on some face-to-face -face models and some key principles. Uh, what we do find is if teachers can get from the PD to the classroom and implement it, the, uh, the student outcomes are somewhat equivalent almost indistinguishable whether the teacher has been through an online or face-to-face -face model. The last piece here I'm going to mention is related to recommendations, and that's uh, recognizing that classroom practice, uh, this happens within a system, and if, if we're going to affect change, we need to consider, once again, systemic reform, that it's not just about the PD, it's also about the curriculum, it's also about the assessment and the resources that are available. There needs to be uh, certainly an understanding that there's multiple things at play here that teachers need to um, be, uh, be offered in terms of resources. And then the classroom assessment of learning teachers also need to, uh, we need to understand what the goals are that play. We need to define these goals explicitly so that it can form not just the, the formative assessment, the short 
uh, the short cycles for, for formative assessment and the learning progressions that help support formative assessment, but also key reasoning tasks and projects that could serve summative assessment. Last, last mention, there are a number of things happening internationally in math and science education where countries that we're, we're very familiar with are doing this work already. I think it would benefit uh, researchers and teachers in the United States if we could re-engage some of those partnerships from a, from a math and science education point of view and not strictly the disciplinary research point of view. Okay.